Turn your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 4. Guys, we are entering a whole new field right now as we go into chapter 4. You know, we've studied, we've spent quite a few weeks in studying the churches as Jesus' letters to those churches. And I think, number one, I hope you learned something. I know I did as your pastor. I learned a lot. I really did. From the study of those churches, you know, obviously those things that Jesus doesn't want in his church, or I should say Jesus wants in his church, and especially those things Jesus does not want within the church. You know, uh, those letters, guys, are for today's churches. I kept saying that over and over and over. I pray, I pray that those leaders of churches will read those letters and see those areas where Jesus says, repent. Amen? So tonight we're going to be studying chapter 4 of Revelation. Guys, there is a major transition that takes place right here in chapter 4 as we go into it. This transition is now going to be those things to come after this. You know, in our past studies, John's writings were of those things that are or for his time, anyway, were in his time. Those churches were in his time. And so Jesus' letters to those seven existing churches were the things that are. Jesus' words in Revelations chapter 1, verse 19, it'll be on the screen, you don't have to turn there. It established the timeline of Revelation, by the way. I mentioned this. It basically gives you the, one of the keys to Revelation is this timeline. Write the things, Jesus said, which you have seen, and the things which are, he's done that, and the things which will take place after that. That's where chapter 4 comes in. The things that will take place after this. This transition is going to be very evident in the first verse as we get into chapter 4. Twice the term after this in the Greek. I only want to use, I'm telling you this in the Greek, it's metatata. Isn't that a cool word? Metatata means after this. After this, referring to those future events. You know, many get a little worried about Revelation as far as those future events and what takes place. I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have to worry about it if you're on the right side of the cross. If you've got Jesus Christ in your life, you're a blood-washed Christian, you don't have to worry about this after this. Okay, guys? You're going to be gone. It'll be a rapture of the church right there. After this, oh, it's God's timing. Think about this. God's timing for his creation has been since the beginning. You guys understand that? From the beginning to the end. Alpha, the omega, the beginning to the end. God knows exactly the timing. From creation to destruction, if you want to say, of mankind upon the earth, or the earth itself, beginning to end. God's timing. God's eternal clock. For mankind, I want to say, eternal clock. God holds a clock. And as we know, God's timing is always perfect. Amen? It's been always perfect in my life. He controls this clock. See, guys, in God's Word, He gives us many clues to His timing, right? Prophecies. Prophecies galore within the Bible. Many prophecies have been fulfilled. I forget 100 to 200 prophecies just alone in Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of that. Those have already been fulfilled. And then, you know, God's word speaks about signs and events and future history in prophecy. But see, none tells us exactly when the end happens. You know that? There is no prophecy that tells us the time of the end. Maybe I should say the time of the new beginning. You know, it's the time of the new beginning, the new heaven, the new earth. It's not the time of the end. God creates a new heaven and new earth. Boy, we'll get to that next year. Anyway, in Daniel, guys, turn in your, turn in your uh, Bibles to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. We're going to go through the 70 weeks of Daniel. And the reason is I want to show you God's timing. There's a definite timing that is displayed within the book of Daniel and his prophecy called the 70 weeks of Daniel. Make sure you turn your Bibles there. We're going to be there just for eh, maybe five minutes or something like that, maybe ten. We're going to read through the whole 
20, verse 24 to uh, 27 of Daniel. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to speak about it a little bit. We're not going to go in depth on this prophecy, 70 weeks of Daniel, because I could take the entire service for that. We're not going to go in depth, but it's going to give you a good idea of God's timing in prophecy. Daniel uh, chapter 9, verse 24 says right there, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand, Daniel writes, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The streets shall be built again, and he and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the, time, the end of, I'm sorry, and, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings, and on the wings of an abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consumption, uh, consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. And you're going, if that's the first time you've ever read that, you go, what is he talking about? I'm going to explain a little bit of it in this timing of these 70 weeks. This prophecy, as I said, is God's timing, and it's a timing for much more than just, just well, I'm going to show you here. Seventy weeks. Now, one number one, 70 weeks. The ancient Hebrew, it, weeks was a unit of seven. They would use that word, weeks, for a unit of seven. It could be seven days. It could be seven weeks. It could be seven years. Those weeks, seven days or seven years. Now, all scholars agree, because of the prophecies and how they came about, that it was seven years. So you had seven weeks times seven years is what? 490 years that we're dealing with. He says right there, 70 weeks are determined. Now, right off the bat, I want to note, the prophecy was for the Jews and Jerusalem. It says right there, for your people and for your holy city. This prophecy was for that. But, it, well, it was not for the church. But what we're going to see is this timing lines up to where we're going to be in Revelation. It's going to line up. See, though the prophecy is towards Israel, its timing is related to the church in those prophecies of Revelation that we'll be studying. Seventy weeks determined for these things to happen. So there's seven sets of seven years, 490 years for this to take place. This prophecy right here. Let's read verse 24 again. It says there, Seventy weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city, that's the Jews, to finish the transgressions, to make an end of the sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. Guys, the most holy, by the way, is Jerusalem. We're not talking about Jesus. We're not talking about somebody holy. Most holy is Jerusalem. That's what they're speaking about. Finish transgressions. Now, some of these have taken place in that list that we just read right there. Some of that has taken place in the prophecies, and some is still yet to come. Finished transgressions. A new order on earth. Man's rebellion against God will be no more. Uh, to make an end to sin. To seal up or to restrain sin. That hasn't taken place yet, unless you guys don't sin anymore. All right? Re a, a reconciliation for iniquity. That has taken place. That recon uh, reconciliation for iniquity was Jesus upon the cross. His blood has washed us. That is our reconciliation. 
Everlasting righteousness, it says there. A new order of society then brought by the Messiah also. A seal up of visions and prophecies basically means all prophecies would have been fulfilled. That has not taken place yet. That's still out in the future. Final stage of human history, basically, is those prophecies being wrapped up and the reign of Jesus. And then anoint the most holy one. And as I said, that uh, the most holy, that is Jerusalem. So you got a little understanding there. We're not going to go in depth, though. So when does the clock start? We got 70 years are determined. When does the clock start? Verse 25. Look there. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. When does the start? When did the clock start? When that command came out. When that command to rebuild Jerusalem. Now see, there's four different possibilities, but there's only really one that matches up. The first one was Cyrus had made a decree giving Ezra and the, and the Babylonian captives the right to return to Jerusalem and build the temple in 538 BC. So there was a decree that went out there towards Jerusalem. Then in Darius made a decree giving Ezra the right to rebuild the temple also in 517 BC. But it was the temple. Adexerxes made a decree giving Ezra permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple now in 458 B.C. But Adexerxes made a decree given Nehemiah. If you ever read the book of Nehemiah, you read all about this rebuilding of Jerusalem, the walls and the streets. He gave them Nehemiah permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the walls in 40. Uh, 445 B.C. Only that particular decree that went out to Nehemiah uh, was made to rebuild the city. You read that there? The streets shall be built again and the wall. The other ones were all based upon the temple. So that is where the clock began of those 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined. Now, at this point, once that happens... Uh, the decree began God's, I want to say a stopwatch, okay? It was a stopwatch. God has it. At that point, bam, he hits the stopwatch. As soon as that decree went out to Nehemiah, 70 weeks and 62 weeks. So there's 69 weeks take place. That's 483 years. I shouldn't even mention this. It's a little bit different than 483 years because the Jewish calendar wasn't based upon 365 days, okay? It's like 360. But we're going to use, just for our head's sake, 483 years. Guys, that timing is exactly when Jesus entered into Jerusalem upon a donkey. That's exactly when he came riding in on that foal of a donkey into Jerusalem, those 483 years later, it says the Messiah will come. Basically, it says, uh, until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks when Jesus rode in. And obviously, a week later, uh, he was crucified. So that was the start of the clock, was back at Nehemiah. 69 weeks of the 70 weeks has happened. Jesus crucified died, buried, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures as we know. That has been those 69 weeks. Where is week 70? We still got one more week, right? We've burned up 69 weeks. Seven more years. Verse 27 there in Daniel. Then he shall confirm a covenant. By the way, you see the little H there? That's not Jesus. That's he, that's the Antichrist, actually, we will learn. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. There's our last week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, and the wing of the abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even till the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This is at the middle of the tribulation, that seven years Halfway through, that is when the Antichrist will reveal himself as wanting to be worshipped. 
getting ahead in Revelation. The 70th week is the book of Revelation, church. You understand? That's why I'm going to Daniel here. That 70th week is. It starts at chapter 4 and it goes through chapter 19. Seven years of tribulations. God's stopwatch has stopped for now. There will be things to come when God's stopwatch will start again. When will God's stopwatch start again? Well, there's a good question. You asked me that, so that's the question. When will it start again? Go to Matthew now. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to see here when God's stopwatch is going to start again. We're going to nail it down, guys. Jesus is going to tell us. In chapter 24, i got to get a drink of water. Whew. Verse 36. Jesus says, but of the day and the hour, no one knows. Okay? We nailed it down. No one knows. The hour and the day, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, he says. But as the days of Noah we were so... Uh, just as they were so will uh, the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did uh, not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. That was your answer, okay? You want to know when the stopwatch beginning? We don't know, guys. But know this, that if the master of the house had come, what hour the thief would uh, had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also, what? Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. When is that stopwatch going to start? It's not for us to know, or even important, guys, when God's stopwatch will, uh, his will start again. What is important? Verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's the important part. Be ready. Be ready. A little FYI for your information. If you are ready, you're going to be raptured just as that stopwatch begins. Click. Just as that happens, as we're going to read in chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Be ready, church. Be ready, be prepared. We will be blessed, amen? Let's pray, and we're going to get into tonight's message. I got time. Boy, whole chapter four here. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. God, that you would uh, show us those things, those things to come, Lord. God, that we would be ready as a church, Lord, uh, and we would look, go out there and find others, too. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight is Glimpse of Heaven. Uh, you're going to get a glimpse of heaven here, guys. Now, chapter 4 is going to begin with a heavenly perspective, church. As we go into chapter 4, there's going to be a heavenly perspective. John looking down first, well, he's going to be looking down on earth but also seeing all from above up there as we get into chapter 4 and chapter 5. But first, a look at heaven itself through John's eyes. That's what we're going to see in chapter 4. We're going to see a look at heaven and what John sees. John will describe many things, I want to tell you, in symbolic form, church. In symbolic form. This vision is written as John seen it. Apostle John, as he's seen it, he wrote it down. I want to read a commentary here. In the description of heavenly, thing, heavenly things, John uses symbols. However, not everything is symbolic, church. There is some to be taken very literally. 
as in the parables of Jesus, many of the details are merely descriptive and they are not uh, necessarily intended to carry a special significance of their own. Also, we should keep in mind the nature of the symbolism. The symbol is always less than the reality, by the way. When we had a glimpse of heaven, <laughs> this is what John shows us, that's just a glimpse, guys. It's less than the reality. The reality of heaven is even greater than the description we have of it. And I could say that through the entire Bible. We do not have a description of what heaven fully is. Now, Spurgeon wrote this. You know, I like Spurgeon. It is very... It is very little that we can know of the future state, he says, but we may be quite sure that we know as much as is good for us. I love that. <laughs> we ought to be uh, as content with that which is not revealed as with that that is. That which is not revealed, we should be content as that which is. God wills us, uh, God wills us not to know. We ought to be satisfied not to know. Depend on it. He has told us about heaven. That is nece necessary to bring us. He's told us enough about heaven necessary to bring us there. And if he had revealed more, it would have served rather for gratification of our curiosity than for the increase of our grace, Spurgeon writes. Chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me and saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Metatata. After this, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there uh, was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So John gives us this first vision. John vision brings... Uh, his vision brings him in the spirit into heaven. He says, I was in the spirit. He went in the spirit. John states clearly that immediately, boom, come on up here. Immediately, boom, he was in the spirit. Guys, that same immediately will be our taking up. As the Bible says, in a twinkling of an eye, boom, just like that. John was up in heaven. The Apostle Paul had an experience in heaven also. He called it the third heaven. By the way, the third heaven, there's the, the heaven of our atmosphere. There's outer space. The third heaven, he's speaking God's heaven. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 12. Now, see, the Apostle Paul's experience, though, he was unsure. John there, he said, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, I'll read uh, 1 through 4 here. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He then says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. He doesn't know. God knows. Such a one was caught up, he says, into the third heaven. And I know such a man, by the way, this is, this is the Apostle Paul speaking about himself. He's using himself as a third, you know, like a third party speaking. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into the paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, Paul went there, and he, there's no description of what he saw. It was just what he heard, right? Now, when we had studied the book of Acts some time ago, uh, and Paul was in Lystra and was stoned, I believe, to death. I personally believe this 14 years ago, he's speaking right here, was happened when he was stoned in Lystra. Because they, when they stoned, they, you just didn't get up from it. I believe he was stoned to death. And Paul experienced this in that time, 14 years prior. But Paul, he saw heaven. He saw heaven and he heard things. 
Now, the question always arises, and probably in your mind too, are near-death experiences true? Are near-death experiences true? Maybe. I don't know. Be honest with you. I do not know. But one thing for sure, if it does happen, it's only a glimpse, guys. It is only a little glimpse compared to what the glory of heaven truly is. I can't tell you for sure. God can do anything he wants, right? Amen? Verse 2. Go back to uh, Revelation there. In verse 2, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald, he says. John speaks of his first sight, right? First thing he sees, one sitting on the throne. That one, Jesus our first sight, church. When you go to heaven, whether it's with the church in the rapture, whether it is you pass away, absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Your first sight, standing before Jesus in all his glory, our first sight. 2 Corinthians 5.10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's the Bema seat of Christ. Guys, when it says the judgment seat, you're not going to be judged whether you're going to make it to heaven or not. You're already there, all right? You're already there. It's not that kind of judgment. It's a judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, personally, as your pastor, I believe those words exactly, exactly what it says. I will be held accountable. My first sight will be standing before Jesus Christ and, and Jesus speaking to me about those things, whether good or bad, standing before him. Like I say, we're not going to be denied heaven. No, you're already there. You're forgiven. You're blood washed. You have eternity. But see, do we not desire, I personally do, to stand before Jesus in the good, right? In the good? Wouldn't you rather stand? I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, man. Well done. Yeah, you're, you, were, you were a sinner, but the fact of the matter is you kept and persevered. Well done. That's what your pastor wants to hear. I'll tell you, I want him to speak about the good. Amen? All those all those ears that heard, all those ears and those lives that were saved in Wheelhoyt, Arizona. Amen. Right here in this town. In verse 3, he says, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, guys. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now, John doesn't describe any distinct figure, does he? He's not speaking about, well, you know, he had a beard and long hair and that kind of thing. No, he's not saying that. He describes basically light of different colors. Light of different colors. This jasper, which is also diamond, guys. It's basically diamonds. Jasper is white like diamonds. And then the sardis stone is red. And, of course, the emerald, the rainbow colors as an emerald. He, he describes this light. Possible significance to this light. Now, by the way, I will not be dogmatic. Means, you know, put my fist down and say this, 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 this. This is what this means on a lot of stuff, guys. This is what I think possibly it could be the significance of this light. The glory of an empty tomb. The glory of an empty tomb. That jasper white, those diamonds. Jesus, white as snow. As those went to that tomb, there was a white light within there. Jesus wasn't in there any longer. Jesus, white as snow. And then that sardis red stone, Jesus' blood shed. Hey, take it or leave it. It's okay, right? You know, some of that stuff, it's not important. This is what John's seeing, though. Then the rainbow colors as an emerald. Where do we hear about a rainbow? In Genesis, right? That rainbow after the flood that God showed the promises to man never to do that again. 
Hey, that could be the significance of it. In verse 4 now, let's move on. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders. By the way, he didn't say like 24 thrones. There's 24 thrones. And there's 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, guys, Jesus has spoken that several times already in Revelation. These lamps, seven spirits of God. Before the throne, uh, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Whoa. <laughs> we're going to get into those creatures here pretty soon. Mm. Like I say, it's important to notice the things that are like and the things that are. There are things we have to take literally. Much of what we read must be taken literally. By the way, when you read the Bible, take the literal interpretation first. Too many people will take a scripture, not necessarily Revelation here and here, and they try to spiritualize and take it way out there. Take the literal interpretation Always first, church. This might seem a little out of this earth. Well, guess what? It is. That's why it seems a little out of this earth. In verse 4, it said there's 24 thrones around. Now, there's 24 thrones around the main throne. By the way, 24 lesser thrones. Not the same size, you know. The main throne's a big throne. And then there's 24 lesser, lesser thrones. John writes, 24 elders upon these thrones. Who are these 24 elders? There we go. There's a good question. 24 glorified human beings? Or 24 angelic beings? Could they be angels that were in heaven, those 24 up there? Or are they glorified human beings, those who had been upon the earth are now up in heaven? It says elders, church. Elders. Elders in the Bible always represents God's people. Represents the people of God, not an angel. Okay, so it says there's these elders, 24. So it is 24 uh, glorified human beings in heaven. Now, here's a possibility. There again, this is what I believe. There were 12 tribes of Israel. 12 elders of Israel are on 12 of the thrones. 12 of the thrones. Now, there's another 12. 12 apostles that turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ are upon the other 12. What have we got? We have the Jews and we have the church. We have them both in the 24 elders. Take it or leave it, you know, it's not real important. Remember that. Whoever they were, they represent God's people, these 24 elders, because elders always represent God's people. They are of God on God's side and they're on our side, right? God's people, so that's a good thing. To whoever they are, it's a good thing. Now in verse 5, read verse 5 again. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And like I said, we've read that in Revelation before about these seven, seven uh, lamps. But there's a whole lot of noise up there, right? Man, there's some stuff going on. There's thunderings and lightnings. Guys, I believe that represents the power and the awe of the throne of God. You know, the power and the awe. Seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God, that is all-inclusive. Not that there are seven Holy Spirits. Remember that? It's just the all-inclusive number of it. Isaiah 11.2 speaks of those seven, and I, I had those underlined. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge and a fear of the Lord. That there represents the all-inclusiveness of really one Holy Spirit, guys. But Jesus describes it as that in earlier in the book, those seven. In verse 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass, a sea of glass like crystal. 
And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. So there's this sea of glass like crystal. You guys know what crystal looks like. Some of you might have a glass at home and you say, well, this is crystal, but it's not. It's just glass. There's a difference, right? Just the, the clearness of crystal. Crystal clear, I guess we could say. I believe this sea of glass, personally, represents God's word giving us clear sight. This sea of glass that surrounds up there in heaven, God's word, the awesomeness of it. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror glass the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord, beholding God through his word, you see. This is how we know everything about God. You know, I've said this before and I'll say it again. This right here will never prove the existence of God, but it speaks everything about God, right? Never prove his existence. Everything else proves his existence. This, though, will tell you everything about it. It opens our eyes through that glass. In James 1.23, you guys know this one. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. The word, church. The word is that glass, that, that crystal glass. God's word gives us a look at ourselves too. You know, this uh, sea of glass John refers to. There again, not being dogmatic about it, okay? But I think it represents the immensity of God's word, guys. Think about it. What is in the word of God? Immensity by all means has all we can ever, ever, ever need right in here. You know, there has never been anything in my life, nor anyone else's life I've ever met, that God's Word can't speak to. Any situation. Is there any other book like that? You know, you, you could get Freudian books and stuff like that. It'll speak about this, it'll speak about that. But this speaks about literally everything. I mean, in reality, it's kind of a science book. It's a history book. It's a medical book. It's, it's got all everything you could possibly need. A morality book, obviously. God's Word speaks to everything, church. Trust in the Word for answers. Trust in the clarity of it. Look through that crystal, that crystal, through the Word of God. Use it as your lens for the world. In verse 6 now, we're going to read there in the end of verse 6. It says... Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, uh, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. These four living creatures. Literal interpretation is needed here, guys, with these four living creatures creatures. Seems weird. Seems out of this world. Yeah, it is. It's supernatural. It's not here on this earth. It is in heaven. Guys, turn your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel. Ezekiel speaks of these very creatures, by the way. I want to look two different places in Ezekiel. And he's going to tell us what these creatures actually are, by the way. John doesn't tell us. He gives a description of them. Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 4, beginning there. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, and a great cloud with a raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of the midst, like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They, they had the likeness of man, each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Now, he says that each one had four faces. Well, you know what? John's only seeing one side at a time. 
He didn't see them all the way around, but let's carry on. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like soles of calves, feet that sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands uh, uh, of a man were under their wings and on the four sides of each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each had the, uh, of the four had the face of a lion, and on the right side, each four had the face of an ox, a calf, all right, an ox, a beast of burden. On the left side, and each of the four had a face of an eagle. Thus, uh, their, thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward, two wings of each of one touched one another, and the two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward, and then and they went wherever the spirit wanted to go. And they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. Uh, the fire was bright, and out of the and. Out of the fire went lightning. John's already spoke about, and then living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Wow, that's out of this world. Turn now to Ezekiel chapter 10. He speaks about these again. Chapter 10, verse 20. I got to move on here. This is the living creature I saw under the God of Israel by the river Shabar, and I knew they were cherubim. They were cherubim. Each one had four faces, each one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same as the faces which I seen by the river Shabar, their appearance and their persons. They each went straight forward, it says there. So these, strange but true, are cherubim up there. All right? Take it literally. That's what they are. These four faces... Now, guys, <laughs> there are so many different analogies or whatever on what these four faces represent. I've heard it speaking, you know, even more countries and all this kind of stuff. Here's what I think. That's what your pastor think. There again, take her to leave it. Not really important. There's the lion. There's the calf or the ox, right? There's the ox, there's man, and there's an eagle. Those four faces, the four complete gospels, church. Four complete gospels. Jesus represented in each. As you know the gospels, Matthew. Matthew is the lion gospel. Jesus, the lion of Judah, there's the lion. Mark. Mark is Jesus as a humble servant, that ox, that beast of burden. In Luke, Luke uh, speaks of Jesus as the man, just a perfect man, basically the second Adam, and John, the eagle, Jesus who came from heaven. Those are the four Gospels. Whatever the interpretation are, they still are literal beings, all right? If I'm all wet, I'm all wet. Don't worry about it, like I say. Not dogmatic about it. <laughs> now, these creatures, though, sound out. This is important. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. They say, who was and is and is to come. They sound out. These creatures sound out. There's no rest. They speak over and over. Holy, holy, holy. By the word, way, in the Hebrew, when there was two words the same, like holy, holy, that was to emphasize, okay? When there's three times, holy, 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 it goes into infinity. Like, infinity and beyond. You know, Buzz Lightyear. You guys ever watch Toy Story? Infinity and beyond. Three holies. Holy, holy, holy. In the Hebrew, would have meant infinity and beyond. Infinity, holiness with no end. Infinite praise. They are praising God. Guys, our praise and song to the Lord needs to be infinite too. Holy, holy, holy. Amen? It needs to be infinite. Never ending. Never ceasing. Good times and bad times. Oh, you had to say that. Good times and bad times. I love what uh, 
David, King David wrote in Psalm 34. In verse 1, it'll be on the screen. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless him at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boasts in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I will bless the Lord at all times, whether good or bad. Guys, you and I know that can be hard. You and I know it can be hard to do at times. Times of trials, times of tribulation in our lives, times, times of uncertainty, you know? Man, many in the church have had that. Times of pain even. It can be hard. Times when all seems the worst. Everything seems bad. Guys, this is when we need to praise His name the more. I'm telling you, yeah, you need to praise God even the more. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul wrote there, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, give thanks. Holy, holy, holy to affinity. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will sing his praises. Amen. Let's finish up here. Verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders now fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. And they're saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Oh, wow. There's a lot of noise going on up in heaven, by the way. Like I say, if you don't like the sound of worship, it's too loud in here during worship. You don't like singing, you're not going to like heaven, period. You're going to be going, nah! you're just not going to like it. <laughs> Continual praise and honor to God is going on. These elders up there, they cast their crowns before the throne. These are Stephanos crowns. In the Greek, Stephanos. Crowns of victory, guys, not crowns of royalty. These golden crowns are crowns of victory. Crowns received by those who won the race. As Paul said, I have finished this race. I, did, I went the distance, you know. Those are Stephanos crowns. We will all, by the way, when you're in heaven, you will cast your crown of victory before Jesus. Oh, you're going to have a crown in heaven. You love the Lord. You've served him. You, you, you've done some works for the Lord. You're not saved by your works. You know that. But the fact of the matter, you receive a crown. And then we'll be casting our crowns before Jesus. Give it back to him. Man, when I stand there in that day and Jesus said, oh, here's a crown. Well done, good and faithful servant. I said, God, take this one back. You know, take this back. Give it to somebody else. We'll all cast our crowns. James 1.12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That is that crown of victory, church. And then there's 1 Peter 5.4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That crown of victory, eternal church, does not fade away. Then there's Revelation 3.11. Behold, I am coming quickly, Jesus says. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. That crown of victory, of perseverance too. Church, hold fast. Hold fast onto Jesus. Things are going to ramp up here pretty soon. I believe, I don't know, don't, don't be dogmatic about that anyway. But the fact of the matter is, hold fast in verse 11, I want to read that. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Guys, when we truly understand our Lord, our God, as a creator, how can we not worship him? How could we not worship God and sing his praise? Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and we're going to worship. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, Lord, that's going to be a glorious time. Father, if, it, if it's a time of when we pass away on this earth and we go to be with you, present before you, Jesus, or if it's a time when you come for your church, it is going to be glorious, God. 
And God, as we cast those crowns out back on that sea of glass, Lord, we're going to praise you. Holy, 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 Lord. Father God, just thank you. Thank you for your word. Jesus, thank you for giving us a little glimpse of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.